There's been a conversation about X-Rank on Twitter that I'd like to address. I talked at some length about Splatoon 2's ranking system, but I haven't really gone into Splatoon 3's since X-Rank came out, so I figure it's time for an update to that video. A lot of the conversations deal more with the mindset that players should be bringing into X-Rank more than a discussion of the mechanics of the mode itself, but before I get into that, I do want to talk about its mechanics for the sake of context. As far as I'm aware, X-Rank matchmaking works the same way it did in Splatoon 2, by taking a number of factors including quality of network connection, weapon range, and power rating from Glico 2, and putting teams together in the best available compromise of these variables. This system, as long as I understand it properly, would work much better than Anarchy Battle matchmaking, because Anarchy also factors in your in-game letter rank, which is a bizarre game design choice. Letter rank isn't tied to anything that's a good measure of player skill, except Glico 2 power. But it's an imperfect measure of the Glico 2 power, and the Glico 2 power is already being factored in, so why do you have the letter rank in there too? I don't understand. Letter rank is designed more to reward playing the game than it is to reward learning more, because it allows for a lucky series to permanently increase your rank instead of sending you back down to a skill level you can handle after you get your butt kicked the next rank up. That makes matchmaking a lot more questionable, so X rank is generally going to result in games that are more closely matched, again as long as I'm understanding the system accurately. X-Rank does have a couple of factors that make it a little bit worse of a measure of player's skill than pure Glico 2 would, but I'm mostly okay with these differences. One of them is the weapon range system. While it leads to better team comps than we saw in Splatoon 2, it still puts together some really bad team comps, and the fact that it subjects even both teams to that awkwardness means that players are sometimes forced to play outside the role they're comfortable with just so they can fill a glaring hole in the weapon comp they're given. There are a few games you'll end up in that are just bad luck comp diff where you'll have to shrug off the loss and go next. That said, I think forcing players to adapt to the situation they're given is actually a strength if approached with a learning mindset. You can always control your own team's comp in a coordinated environment, but you can still never control the other teams, and if they pull out something niche that you haven't seen before, you need to be able to spot your win conditions in a few seconds while you're rolling out into mid. Getting used to solo queue, where the comps are gonna be whatever the game decides to give you, can help you spot these win conditions faster if you're training yourself to look for them. Another ostensibly worse aspect of X-Rank is that the game has a ticket system like Anarchy Battles. If you win a best of 5, you always gain points, and if you lose the best of 5, you always lose points, regardless of the difficulty of those matches. While this, on paper, makes the system worse at determining an accurate ranking of solo queue players, it's the least of my concerns about it. It does lead to inflation, in that top players' scores especially are going to go way higher than they'd be able to in pure Glico systems. We already have a player who's hit 4k X power, when 3k was only reached by a tiny number of elite, mostly Japanese players in Splatoon 2. But since that affects everybody equally, and no individual player's ranking is going to change much because of it given enough data, I think it's an overall positive, cushioning the blow of a tough loss if you're able to make up for it with later games. Really, the biggest problem with X-Rank is just that it's a solo queue game mode, one where you can't bring in a team. This is the primary way that the mode is at odds with what the competitive Splatoon community values. We don't measure how well individuals perform in tournaments. We measure whether the team they're on wins or loses. There are social skills and in-game verbal communication being tested by our tournaments, and X-Rank will never test those abilities at all. There are some decisions you'd make in a coordinated environment, knowing more about how your teammates are going to respond, that you just can't afford to try and make an X-Rank because your teammate probably won't know how to follow up if they haven't practiced with you. It makes a non-factor out of an entire broad skill set that you need to succeed in competitive Splatoon. If a tournament organizer is seeding a tournament, and the players have top level X powers but the team has competed frequently and never made it higher than Gamma Bracket and Low Ink, those tournament results should take precedence over the X power. Will that ever happen? No, but that is the correct call in the situation. So if X-Rank isn't really important for ranking what the competitive scene cares about most, 
what use is it? Well, it's always going to be better to practice in a team environment, so if you have the ability to scrim that day, scrimming is probably going to be more useful for you than anything else. But, for most teams, team practices are infrequent enough that you want to spend more time practicing than what you can do with the team. Team practice, limited as it usually is, is best spent working on teamwork, on developing intuitive synergy between teammates, testing and practicing game plans and weapon comps, figuring out things about how your team will play that you can't figure out on your own. If there are things you can figure out on your own, then you shouldn't worry about those in team practice because that time is limited, and the time you can play on your own is less limited. Set goals as a team, but if any of those goals are mechanical in nature, working on aim or combat movement or movement around the map or awareness, things an individual can practice in solo queue, solo queue can actually be a more valuable place to practice those things, because you're not wasting the team's time with something you could be doing on your own. Solo queue, in de-emphasizing teamwork, makes solo mechanical outplays more important. X-Power is a pretty darn good measure of which of two players would win in a 1v1, if not so much a 4v4. While in a coordinated environment, a better plan executed successfully beats a more overall skilled team. One of the most important rules of Splatoon to remember is that something is always going to go wrong. When things go wrong, a mechanical outplay is one of the ways you can stabilize and make it so the team doesn't have to abandon the plan. If you're about to launch a four-player special push but someone gets splatted right at the beginning, being able to quickly trade that player back without going down yourself means you're in a 3v3 and the special push can continue more or less as you drew it up. That sort of play is something you can learn pretty well from playing solo queue, because it's one of the only ways you can have an outsized impact on a teamfight without direct coordination with your teammates. One problem with this emphasis on solo mechanical outplays is that a solo mechanical outplay is more likely to happen because the other team doesn't have callouts. In a coordinated setting, it only takes one player to see you for your stealth to be compromised. In solo queue, if the player who sees you isn't in range to do anything about you, you're effectively still in stealth. Your target isn't going to suddenly snap 180 degrees around to look at you because their teammate who's still spawning in saw the ink you were putting down on the map two seconds ago. People who play too much solo queue compared to coordinated play tended to opt into mechanical outplays at the expense of safer, more coordinated plans, even when they have the resources to play in a coordinated fashion. It's just force of habit. They're not used to being able to call for help and set something up that's more likely to succeed. So practicing solo needs to be pretty mindful practice. You need to be thinking about why you're doing what you're doing and evaluating whether you're doing this because it'll work in solo queue or because it'll work in general. If your primary goals are team oriented, getting certain tournament results, solo queue is beneficial up to a certain point. Once you hit a certain level, which was around 2600 in Splatoon 2 and maybe 2900-ish in Splatoon 3, give or take, that's a really rough estimate, you've reached a point of diminishing returns for what you can learn in solo queue. Your mechanical skill won't improve that much more at this point, and from here, decision making determines winning and losing the most. You may be mechanically better than other players, but they're good enough that you can't just win 1v2s against them without a weapon that's designed to do that and a team that's built to facilitate that and good timing. They'll understand the theory of taking fights and position themselves well enough that there will be someone shooting at you from an off angle while you engage on their teammate, and even if you outplay the first player you engage on, that 2900 X power player getting free shots on you the entire time you're splatting their teammate, they're not going to waste that opportunity. There starts to be a pretty hard ceiling once you look at teams around Div 2 or higher for mechanical skill. You get to that point, and it doesn't matter how well you can press buttons if your team doesn't have a better plan than their team does. Getting to this high of a level in solo queue starts to train different skills than you need to succeed in a team setting. You hear about players picking weapons based on what they can be most independent with, based on what solo queue teams tend to be bad at. It becomes a different game, sort of like how it takes a different skill set and knowledge base to play Salmon Run than it does to play Turf War. 
If your goal is to break X power records, then of course solo queue practice is valuable practice. But historically, the highest X powers have come from players that also dominate tournament play, like Zero in the West and Melon in Niagara in Japan. Ultimately, if you play the game thoughtfully, there's a lot solo queue can teach you, and you should be able to see how situations differ from solo queue to competitive play. I would still say that competitive play is better practice though, that experience with a coordinated team is more transferable to solo queue than solo queue is to coordinated play, since coordinated play tests all the same skills but also adds the dimensions of communication and game planning. Now unfortunately, the conversation online has barely had anything to do with anything I've talked about so far. See, solo queue presents a unique challenge in that you're alone, and the players you're up against are relatively anonymous, at least until you reach a level where you're seeing the same tournament players a lot. That means that, unlike on the mic, where you have teammates listening and you have team morale to consider, you're free to talk as much crap to yourself about you, your teammates, or your opponents as you want. You're less incentivized to restrain yourself from falling into negative patterns of thinking. Nobody's there. There are no immediate obvious consequences besides what's going on inside your own head. People who fall into these patterns have a really hard time realizing how negatively it's affecting their gameplay, because they'll either get down on themselves and just assume the results are disappointing because they're a bad player, when really the results are just disappointing because they're getting upset and it's distracting them from what they really need to be thinking about, or they'll lash out at whatever they can think to blame besides themselves. Their teammates are awful, or the game is unbalanced, when really whether this is true or not, it's outside your control, and thinking about things you can't control is distracting you from actually attending to the things you can control and making you play worse. If you're trying to tell me you can't climb an X rank because of bad teammates, I'm sorry, that's a mindset issue. If lucky rolls on teammates were what determined who ranked the highest, it wouldn't always be some top-level comp player hitting record X powers. It could just be some random player we'd never heard of. Glico 2 works. I've gone on record multiple times saying that I think your Splatoon 2 X power was accurate to within 100 to 150 points. A player 150 points higher than you would be expected to beat you more often. The Splatoon 3 system may need slight tweaks to that range, since scores are inflated and so there's a bigger range overall now, but it should still be accurate by proportionally the same amount. Yeah, you can show me one individual game where it looks pretty unwinnable despite you doing really well, but those games happen to top players too. They don't win every game either. What they do that you don't is play well enough that on average, they win more games than you do, that fewer games are really unwinnable to them, that more games are quick decisive stomps. You've got to look at the long-term trends and not individual games, like with any system trying to make conclusions from limited data. If you play often enough and look at multiple games back to back to back, you will see that those unwinnable games are outliers that didn't individually determine where you're at. 100 points is a lot to lose in X power, but it's very rare to lose that much because of a single game, and even if it were to happen, despite the ticket system, that that one game caused you to lose the ticket and lose 100 points, the worst case scenario, I don't look at a player with a 2200 peak and a 2300 peak much differently at all. In fact, if the 2200 level player has experience with callouts and the 2300 player doesn't, the 2200 player is probably a better addition to a competitive team. Also, now that the system works the way that it does, one bad game impacts your score less than it did in Splatoon 2. Even if you lose two games that, according to Glico 2, should have cost you 75 points each, if you win the next three games, even games that should have given you one-tenth of a point, for winning, according to Glico 2, because they were so easy, that's plus 10 on the ticket. Your teammates' decisions aren't under your control, but there are two things that are under your control. How you adapt to your teammates' decisions, and how you moderate your emotional state while you're playing. These tend to go out the window as soon as you start teammate blaming. Also, directing negativity toward even unnamed anonymous players makes people more nervous that they're being judged while playing, and that self-awareness leads them to play worse. Being supportive and not shaming people 
will literally make the players around you, just the people who follow you on Twitter, better in the long run. This goes double for people that are actually on your team. Back in Splatoon 2, when I did Pairs League with a teammate of mine, they would get really negative about our teammates sometimes, and I started to get the thought in my head, man, is this how he's thinking during team practice when I make a mistake? Is he holding off criticizing me like this just because I'm his teammate? Because I don't think I'm playing that much better than these teammates, but he's always going off on them, regardless of what's going on. He must also think this about me at least some of the time. It made me feel more self-aware when I played with him and that always made me feel more nervous and play worse. X-Rank is absolutely a valid statistical measure of a certain set of skills, and while that skill set is incomplete compared to what a competitive player needs, it's valuable and it definitely counts for something, even at the highest level. Most players will never get to the skill level at which they don't have anything they can learn from solo queue that's transferable to competitive play. For the vast, vast majority of players, it is good mechanics practice that they should be doing some of the time that they're not playing with their team if they want to be improving as a team as quickly as possible. I have to think, even as a top-level player, there's, a, there's at least something that you can probably take from your experience with solo queue into that environment. It's great to set goals during team meetings for accountability's sake, even about what you're going to be doing during solo play. It's just... It shouldn't be something that you ever do mindlessly. Thoughtless practice reinforces bad habits at the same rate and frequency that it reinforces good ones. If you just play solo for 8 hours a day, there's no shot you're mentally engaged the whole time, thinking at the intensity you will be during tournaments, until you've built up a lot of stamina. So you also won't be determining whether something you're practicing is useful in coordinated play or not, and you'll develop quote-unquote solo queue habits. But then, I would also argue that there is no thoughtless practice that you can do that will help you. Thoughtless practice with your team causes the same kinds of problems. If your mind is starting to fatigue, and you're missing things you know are usually second nature, something you've been doing well for the last six months, the best thing you can do for yourself is not to stay on that grind set, it's to turn the game off and take a break. Touch some grass, drink some water, get some exercise, send a meme to your friend, take care of yourself. It takes time to train the mental stamina top players need to get through long tournaments with full mental intensity intact. The longer you can play mindfully, the better, but if you just keep playing despite losing mindfulness, you'll set yourself further back in the long run. If you're a team captain trying to build a team, here's my advice. You do want players who are in the same ballpark as the rest of the team in X-Power. If you've got a 2900 level player on a team that's otherwise 2300, that player is likely to get frustrated or bored, and the others are going to feel bad struggling to keep up. But having a frontliner who's a few hundred points higher than the others isn't a big deal either. If you have no other information, X-Power is a pretty good approximation of the level a player is at, but always try them out so you can test the skills X-Power doesn't tell you. So their communication, their social skills, their decision making, their adaptability, even just things like whether they show up to practice on time or have a good attitude. If they have a bunch of posts on Twitter about how X-Power sucks because they always get terrible teammates, even if they're the better player, pick someone else over them. That's going to keep them from learning and growing, and your team will improve faster without them.